this session uh, is, builds on this, the, the last session uh, with the Secretary of State, which is about uh, what does it mean to be an educated person. Uh, as chair, I'll try and keep my opinions out of this debate as much as I can, but in terms of the RSA, I'll just talk about a few areas where our interests intersect with this. Uh, first of all, we are an organisation built on the principles of the Enlightenment 300 years ago, but we're doing some new thinking about what does the Enlightenment mean in the 21st century and what are the values and skills that societies and young people and all people need in a, in a new century. Secondly, uh, we often feel that debates around the curriculum and what does it mean to be educated starts with the wrong question. Uh, sometimes you need to think about the who. Who should decide what should be educated? Where's the locus of control and how should that decision making take place at national, local, school, and obviously at pupil level as well? So we are interested in the who around this as well as the what. And thirdly, uh, we're also interested in, uh, and we do a lot of this with our academies, in both developing skills in addition to knowledge, but also a focus on practical learning. And I hope at some point during today, we'll think about whether what people call a general education includes elements of practical learning. Before I introduce the, the, the three speakers, uh, Michael Gove uh, quoted a communist history, I think, today. So I'll start by quoting a communist comedian, Alexei Sale, uh, who talked about him, he, he, the risks about him becoming over-educated. He felt he now knew so much that he was in danger of forgetting something really important. He imagined one day somebody would tell him a new fact, like the capital of an obscure Eastern European country, and he would forget how to walk by learning one fact. So there may be, we may want to also talk about over-education as well as under-education within this. We've got three great speakers today. Uh, we've got Vic Goddard, who's uh, head teacher at Passmore Academy in, in Harlow. Manira Mirza, who's deputy mayor with responsibilities for uh, education, but also of culture. And we hope to come back to those questions around culture and the arts within this debate. And we've got Tim Brighouse as well. I'm going to give each speaker uh, up to 10 minutes. I've asked them not to focus too much on literacy and numeracy, because I think we just need to take that as read, that we all agree literacy and numeracy are crucial to, to educating a young person. I've also asked them to focus only on young people. We could have this question thinking about lifelong learning as a whole, but for the purposes of this hour, I think we should think about what does it mean to be an educated 11-year-old and an educated 19-year-old in particular. So, Vic, over to you. Morning, everybody. Um, this was really daunting. Uh, I'll tell you the main reason it's daunting is because the gentleman at the far end, I've stolen everything from over the years, dressed it up as my own, and sold it to my staff. <laughs> so I've actually had to think of things today. Um, so that, that's a part of the problem. The other, I do need to apologise for my moustache also. I do apologise for that. Mr. Wilshaw will say it requires improvement later, and there will be a new category of uh, capacity to improve called unlikely. So, this is. Can I have the first slide up? Whoever's doing slides. Have we got a slide or not? Doesn't matter. There's only two slides. We might make it, doesn't matter. Um, the first is a quote from Louise Stoll, and I think Louise Stoll actually worked here, which I didn't know when I saw it. Um, and for me, it's about the breadth of what it looks like. I love that expression at the end of that quote about, you know, need to capture the breadth of what it's likely to take to flourish in the 21st century. That, that for me, just gave me the the impetus I needed. I, I had to look around for this to say, because I couldn't steal Sir Tim's stuff. Do you want to just click through all the points on the next slide? Just put them all up at once. It'll make life easier. Um, and in looking through, I um, ended up f sort of falling upon um, the president of the American um, History Association, a man called William Cronin. And look, he's written loads of stuff about it. And he, he's got a, an article called Only Connect. For the literary people amongst you, you'll know where that comes from. Um, and the points there for me were, as a, as a timetable, as somebody's done a timetable, when I got asked to do this, I, I thought I was just going to write a curriculum map, and that's the first thing I wanted to do, was to write subjects down. But actually, we all know how flawed that is. We've seen that debate this morning. So listening here was an obvious one for me. It meant not just, um, not just the ability to sit and do that, but I think that's a, a real challenge for our young people in, uh, today. How many of them, when they're actually having a conversation, truly listen without looking down at their phone or anything else. That's such a skill that I think we will lose in the 21st century if we're not careful. The ability to actually hear what the nuances of somebody's conversations are, to be able to track logic, to be able to do those types of things. Um, read and understand, and I think the importance of reading both the front page and the back page of a newspaper and understanding both and the, and the purpose of both. 
Um, but not just the obvious bit about reading, but also be able to read a situation, be able to look at the aesthetics of an athlete and read why that's important and what, what makes it look like it does. Um, talking with anyone, I think talking is a skill we're losing. Um, I think it's an important one for somebody who makes their living talking. Um, I think the ability to give a speech, to ask a thoughtful question, to make people laugh in, in a real sense is something that if, you're going, if we're going to educate young people, they need to be able to do that. The exam factory model, which we've got concerns about, will not help with that in any way. Um, writing, a, writing um, the, the writing clearly and persuasively and movingly, I, I just think it's about the ability to express your own mind. Have, have our young people got the ability to express what they truly think? And I think they, there's, we can, you know, we can put uh, spelling, punctuation, and grammar at the heart of that, or whatever you want to do. But actually, are they are they able to touch somebody with the ability to write? And if, if they're not, then I think we're underselling that as, as an important thing. Solving puzzles, problems, I think that's probably at the core of a 21st century education because we don't quite know what their lives are going to be, but we know that whatever it is, it's going to be something that they're going to have to solve. Every job we, we do, there's a, there's a way of making it more efficient or anything else, and that's, that's a key one for me. Um, rigor. Rigor's, rigor's quite an interesting one because I think Mr. Gove would say from this morning that rigor means ex examinations and that's the only type of assessment, and that's not what I'm saying, obviously. Um, but, you know, we want them to love learning. We want them to love the process of learning. Um, the ability to combine knowledge and values, however, is at the key for that for me. Uh, there was a quote that I, I saw for somebody. For the, the purpose of a lot, it's for the rigor, rigor that takes place for the purpose of a larger vision that is underpinned by human values, it was not underpinned by human values, is worthless. Actually, knowledge is fine, but if it isn't dehumanized, that's the biggest fear for me. We can give these young people the knowledge that, of our history, of our past, but actually what values does that help them grow and underpin for them? Um, I'm a huge person with, with humility and tolerance and empathy for me. Actually, the ability to empathize, the ability to place yourself in somebody else's, in somebody else's feet and you know, walk in their shadow is, is such an important skill for our young people. Children in Need yesterday showed that. I, have, I, I work in a very white working class school. Um, I had probably 60, 70 boys in cow-like onesies yesterday. You know, it's not cool to walk to school in a cow-like onesie. But if it's acceptable when you're there and they understand it's for a purpose and it's to raise money, and you know, I don't want to lose that from any school. And I think that's my biggest fear, is that as it becomes more and more about exams and academia, and that's fine. I'm, I'm all for raising standards. I don't think Mr. Gove quite realizes that he's in a room full of people that agree with raising standards, because that's what we do every single day of our lives. Um, but actually, we can't lose the other things that make us human beings. And that, that's the most important thing for me. I, I think that's probably my 10 minutes. I think I've waffled through enough there. That's my, that's my, uh, that's my point. So the, the, the title is very important. I haven't spoken about technology, because actually, everything's about connections. Our future's about connections, how we connect, how we interact. And so the only connect title was the obvious one for me. Technology will, will grow and underpin everything we do and be part of everything we do, but it is still a tool. The human spirit is still the thing that we have to celebrate and develop. Um, and we can do that through a variety of ways, but the biggest way is to actually allow them to become human beings. There you go. Thank you. Thanks very much, Dick. Tim. <coughs> well, I don't, I don't think I disagree with any of that. Good, I stole it from you somewhere, Tim, so I should hope not. <laughs> it sounds as though I'm not, I'm not registering, am I? No. Yes. You yes. Are yes. You are now. Thank okay. Um, two things to supplement it, because I'm saying I'm not disagreeing with it, um, which puts a different, well, a slightly different flavour on it. Um, one is the purpose of education was best expressed for me by a guy called Temple who influenced Butler in the 44 Act. You're already thinking, oh my God, we're not going to go into history, are we? <laughs> um, no, we're not. But he said, are you going to treat a person as they are or as they might be? Are you going to treat them, treat them as they are with many of their tastes warped, with their powers largely crushed? Or are you going to treat them as they might be, with the full development of their powers, capable of 
doing anything to fulfill themselves and fulfill others. And then he went on to say, business requires that you should treat them as they are, the adult life. Morality requires you should treat them as they might be. And he says, you can't have justice at the basis of your social life until you raise what they are to what they might be. And he goes on to say, and that's the whole purpose of education, schools, and teachers. And then he goes on to describe how that's at the root of political freedom, and you can't have political freedom any more than you can have social freedom until, until that justice, until that's happened. And then he, he says, and it's individual freedom too, individual justice, because he says, because over and over and over again, we find people with this cause which is just, who are unable to express it in a way which might enable it to prevail. And actually, it's great to be in London on a Saturday, uh, because in the mid-80s, do you remember the uh, miners' strikes? Uh, well, I had experience of the miners' strikes that had happened on a Saturday the following Monday, uh, because I opened the Daily Mail, and there I saw two kids being carted out of Trafalgar Square and put in the back of a police van. And one of them I knew very well indeed. Right? It was my son. <laughs> uh, and uh, th these two youngsters were falsely charged. I'm not getting at police because I think police do a fantastic job. But just on that occasion, there were false charges made against them. And that particular youngster, my youngster, who was at university in London, said, told me that he didn't want me butting in. So just keep out of things, I'll handle it. Now, which one gets off and which one gets a suspended sentence? No prizes for guessing, because the other one had been bunking out of school since he was 14 from Doncaster. And I always remember reading this temple thing and thinking, by God, that's right. And he ends by saying, there exists a mental form of slavery which is as real as any economic form we're pledged to destroy it. If you want human liberty, you must have educated people. Now, I happen to think that's what teachers and schools do day in, day out. And that's the ultimate goal. You know, we look at mottos of schools. They tell you a lot, actually. The school I'm involved in has got a fantastic motto, in my view, which is for kids to think for themselves and act for others. It's better than the other way around, isn't it? Um, think for others and act for yourself. Anyway. I think that's incredibly important, and I would want for kids when they leave in year 13 that they have that capacity. Now, I think that capacity is going to come as a result of having an education and being in an ethos where it is clear that people are being encouraged to act, uh, to act for others and think for themselves. And by the way, I think there's a huge implication over the next 10 years for how we involve pupils in the whole educational process. On the whole, by the way, on that one, we've been content with promoting schools, councils, youth parliaments, etc. It is much, much, much more than that we're talking about if we're gonna have youngsters emerge able to do that. And the other point I'll make, and then I'll shut up, um, is this, because it, it brings a slightly different slant on it. Um, it seems to me that we, sh th that old tawny quote, which I'll get wrong, but some of you will know about it, which is we sh the wise state or the state should want for other people's children that which the wise parent wants for their own. And I'm sure that's right. And one of the most powerful things, and I personally think this is something you might do really um, powerfully in London, but you'll need to involve the boroughs in it, um, is I think we need to argue about what a community want as a set of experiences for their youngsters between 5 and 11 and 11 and 16 and 18. And those, i.e. judge them by what you would want your own child to have. Well, for me, that would be taking part in a public performance two or three times during their primary career. This is just a primary example. Uh, look at people who've been to Eton. I mean, they have no part, difficulty at all in taking part in public performances. The only problem is that it seems to me that occasionally those schools give people a false sense of confidence 
that they can do things they can't, like run the economy or run the country. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but I would want every kid to have that feeling with a degree of self-doubt, which Fix re referred yeah. to, mm. um, which does seem to me to be occasion absent. Um, secondly, that we should find out what they're particularly good at uh, by seven, eight, nine, and give them expert support. Now, that, I hope that that would be within the arts and sport, and I hope they would get expert support. Anybody who's read Bounce will know what I'm talking about, which is real practice. So, and the third thing they might do is take part in a residential experience, the intensive interest-led set of learning thinking through the curriculum in terms of those things that we occasionally do for a day or a week or whatever. Fourthly, that they would, in a group, prepare, design, and create, and deliver a multimedia or school book, or a book, to another generation, and then critique it. And finally, that they would take part in year six, and I would say into year seven, where there's a huge gap um, in, in uh, an environmental audit that affects the whole community and displays it to the local community. Now, if every community decided what those things would be, you would have a local curriculum that really made sense. And that's what we want. We want a local com curriculum, a national and an international. I could go on, I'm not. But I would simply say this. Let's make sure that all the kids at dangerous ages, and their ages of transition where the gaps occur, and where the gaps get wider, let's make absolutely sure that they march on to the next stage with confidence. And that would mean your school, Vic, having a profile of a kid arriving at you, not with its 2A, 3B, 4C, though I'm all in favour of that because I'm with you on literacy, but also this kid is just obsessed with developing Absolutely. X and Y. Uh, because it's through that obsession that comes the fire, the determination and the character to grow up, to be a person who can think for themselves and act for others. Thank you. So, can I just pick up a point? You, you speak about talking to children and getting them involved. Please, can we stop talking to children about toilets and uniforms? Because that's what school councils are driven by. And it kills me. It absolutely kills me. They've got so much more to talk about than that. Ask them what actually matters. What does it feel like to be in your class? How good is this happening? How, how, how is your learning helping you move forward? Please stop talking about toilets, because that's the school. They've got so much more to add. Toilets are really important. Come and see yeah, I'm going to say they are beautiful. important. Um, <laughs> we've got beautiful toilets. But it, it's, they have so much more to give. And I think that's, that's the key thing for me. Ask, actually ask them. That's, it will kill me if not. Soapbox Thanks, Vic. Thank you. Um, well, good morning, everyone. Or just about good morning. Um, we heard a lot this morning about uh, different international comparisons, and I thought I would come at this in a slightly different way um, by looking at historical comparisons, uh, because every society throughout history has asked this question and responded in a slightly different way. What does it mean to be educated? So if you go back far into time uh, to the ancient Greeks, they had a very particular idea of what an educated citizen would look like. It would be somebody who had been prepared for uh, military action. Uh, the education was very much geared around military training, preparation for physical combat, uh, as well as that about preparing people to become citizens, particularly in Athens, uh, a reasoning, critical mind, uh, somebody who can engage in debate and discussion. And there was an emphasis on the intellectual development of uh, young people uh, through the humanities, through science, uh, music and art, uh, 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 an attention to the whole person. And, and it's a very interesting model, and, and throughout different periods of history, people have tried to replicate uh, what the ancient Greeks did. If you fast forward in time and go to the Jesuits model uh, about 400 years ago, you get a variation on that. You get, uh, uh, obviously driven by Catholic uh, missionary um, zeal, uh, a belief that uh, young people were uh, both intellectual beings but also moral beings. And in a way, a bit like the ancient Greeks, uh, the Jesuit movement was about training people to go out and be soldiers, but in a very different way, not physical combat, but religious and spiritual combat, to go out into the world 
and to, uh, to master an understanding of the world in order to share a spiritual view uh, with others. And there was a great attention in Jesuit teaching to the classics, to teaching literature, to expanding young people's minds, but at the same time, giving them that moral dimension. Uh, if you go back into the 19th century, uh, what this country is famous for around the world, the development of the public school system, the Eton's, the Winchester's, the rugby school, and so on, uh, you have, again, a very different purpose to education. Uh, education for essentially creating the men of empire, the men who would go out and fight on the battlefield for Britain, or who would man a post in sub-Saharan Africa on their own, would have to deal with lots of uh, native communities and so on. And the kind of education that the public schools uh, emphasized, as well as the intellectual development of the mind, particularly they were keen on uh, stretching the mental capabilities of young people. So uh, teaching resilience, teaching capability, teaching courage and teamwork. There was a huge emphasis on sport. There's a, uh, uh, a huge history and to be written about the relationship between sports and public education and the, the creation of uh, the codification of sport and how playing cricket was the way in which you trained young men uh, to run the empire uh, and to have a sense of the greater sacrifice for your team, for your country, uh, for your religion, and so on. Uh, contrast to the public school education, the other thing this country is very famous for is the grammar schools education, which is very different, I think. Um, the grammar schools were uh, not really about training the aristocracy or the people who ran empire, but more the, the middle classes, the, the people who um, eventually became writers and thinkers and scientists. There's much more interest, I think, in, in the grammar school system, in the intellectual. And in fact, it's the grammar schools, really, that I think are, uh, uh, should be credited with um, the kind of the great flourishing of creativity and intellectual development that, that Britain had um, throughout the last two, uh, three centuries. Um, all these different systems, these education systems, um, are varied, have different emphases, are products of different kinds of societies. But there are, I think, three things which are common to all of them. And which I think make for a good education system. The first is a belief and a commitment to the transmission of knowledge and the idea that you're not just educating that individual for their own personal journey in life, but you're educating the next generation and the future of your society. And in the transmission of knowledge, uh, there was a real attention in all these systems to subject knowledge. Um, I don't think um, my two other um, panelists have really talked about subject knowledge, but I think subject knowledge was key to that, and a sense that there are certain things that have to be passed on to the next generation, otherwise they will be lost forever, whether it's in the sciences, the arts, in history, the best that's been thought and said as it's, um, as it's been um, uh, phrased in the past. The second element was, through teaching this knowledge, you were at the same time uh, creating a side effect, which was the training and the discipline of the human mind, and you were teaching young people to uh, restrain themselves, but also to become creative. Uh, by learning facts, learning theories and concepts, uh, they would then go out and become critical thinkers. And there was a sense in all of this of discipline, of uh, forcing oneself to go through a process in order to learn. Um, there isn't much in Jesuits' writing about children enjoying themselves, actually. There's a lot of pain, there's a lot of uh, unhappiness. Uh, as anyone who's been to um, any of those schools will tell you. Robert Hughes, the cultural critic, um, in his biography, if you ever get a chance to read it, um, has a brilliant section in it about um, his Jesuit um, education, um, which made him the man that he was, a brilliant, brilliant cultural writer. Um, but it's very much about um, uh, training oneself um, for a future um, of uh, critical thinking. And then finally, the third element was that in all these education systems, even though they only ever reached um, one section of society, each uh, school would have a universal view of what a child should know, and there would be a core curriculum for all those children, a sense that every child would be treated the same. Not every child learns at the same pace, but every child would have access, uh, equal access to um, this knowledge. And those um, elements, I think, uh, were present in the initial founding of the comprehensive system. And this idea, as David Aronovich said earlier, of the grammar schools for all concept, that every child, uh, regardless of their background, uh, should have a chance to access that knowledge and to develop that kind of mind. Um, uh, there's a real aspiration for that. And it's uh, what you might call, um, for want of a better phrase, a classical liberal education or a humanist education. Our society 
this generation, the previous generation, is probably the first time and the only time that a society has ever really started to challenge and question those three principles, I think. And for good or for bad, um, has started to explicitly say that subject knowledge is perhaps not um, the primary purpose of education, uh, that the idea of transmitting a canon of knowledge, what, what everybody um, should learn, that that's contested, um, and that, in fact, uh, the idea that the teacher would be the authority and be able to pass on this knowledge to young people, that's constantly under question, has been in the last um, few decades. And the idea that there's personalized learning. So not every child in the school, in the comprehensive school system, uh, as was mentioned in the earlier, se uh, earlier session, not every child will be doing a core academic knowledge up until the age of 16, but some will be uh, encouraged earlier on to take vocational pathways. Um, and um, obviously the government uh, today is uh, trying to challenge that and, uh, and change that. Um, lots of people will see that development as progressive and as a step forward, a leap ahead uh, from what we've had uh, for the last few centuries. My own personal view is that um, I think it's healthy that we have a, a, questioning, uh, a questioning education system, that we, we encourage young people to be critical and questioning. Um, but there have been those elements present in previous education systems too. Uh, I think it's a, a, a loss, though, to lose the concept and the, the core of subject knowledge and teaching of subject knowledge. I know that makes me sound very traditionalist, but I do think that's incredibly important, and it's sometimes missed in the debate. Uh, and that what's um, sometimes happened in schools is that schools are seen as uh, places where all sorts of other very important aspects of education, uh, careers advice, environmental awareness, teaching kids life skills like how to write a CV or um, uh, 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 how to um, cook a meal. All those things are important, but they are things that are not unique to the school. The thing that a school can do, that parents struggle to do, that communities struggle to do, that new migrant communities struggle to do, working class communities struggle to do, is to teach subject knowledge. And so when it comes to asking the question, what is an educated person? Uh, at school, uh, at the age of 16, I think it's to have uh, a grounding in those things so that then young people can go off and make decisions. They can choose a vocational pathway. They can choose uh, to go into work or they can choose to study. Uh, and that they have uh, the capacity and the capability um, of the reasoned mind uh, that they can go off and learn and, and, and as we said earlier, be authors of their own future. That's mine. Thank you. Thank you. I guess the other thing in common to the, the, the three historical uh, references you made was that none of them were trying to educate the whole of their population. They were choosing yeah. a segment of their population to educate. So there may be something in universalizing that experience that you do need to change, but you're right. Well, that's, a, that's an interesting The, the other point I'd make is, uh, I mean, I've been doing this as a teacher and in, in various other forms for, for, for a number of years now, and I've never met anybody who doesn't believe subject knowledge uh, isn't important. So. Um, well, it depends on how, what you mean by it. I, I have, I have, and right. I've read things about it. Okay. Have that uh, no, knowledge, knowledge helps place how young people place themselves in a context. Knowledge of the past, knowledge of the present gives them a context for their own belonging, which I understand. But knowledge without the ability to apply it just makes you a dictionary. And that's worthless. On its own, it's worthless. If they can take that knowledge, subject knowledge, we're... We were a Prince's Sinclair Teaching Institute school, which is very much about subject knowledge, and I, I completely agree that that's something we need to deliver, but they need to be able to apply it to their own context, their own future, their own lives. In its own right, it's just a book that's never read. I mean, I would say that that, that was the case throughout all these different systems that I've talked about as yeah. well. Um, but, it's, but today it's sometimes uh, framed or caricatured that in the past they just did facts and they just did knowledge, but they weren't able to apply it. Well... You know, the grammar school system generated huge, huge numbers of creative engineers, scientists, artists, writers. So that creativity was always uh, uh, integral to teaching uh, the subject, I think. Who would yeah. like to start with that? I say the, the direct thing for me, I, I absolutely, I have to say, I absolutely agree with you. My fear is, is what's coming out with the new curriculum and what we hear on the stage today is that actually it's just about recall, not about critically analysing it, asking questions, doing things you've described. And my fear is the path we are starting to go down 
is about recall again. And recall, you know, remembering where we come from is important, but actually only if it helps us move to where we're going to go. And, and for me, the, my biggest fear is whatever happens with the curriculum, and I've sold my soul to a Tory pound and I'm, a, I'm an academy, I haven't got to do it. He can write the curriculum as he wants. He's given me the power not to do anything. But the moment it goes into a league table, it's going to put pressure on me to do so. And so my fear is I, I end up being somebody who just becomes the sage, on, the, the sage on the stage rather than being part of their learning journey. That's my fear of the knowledge-driven curriculum that seems to be talked about at the moment. So that's, I mean, I think that would, I would characterize mm. as a, you know, a concern about subject knowledge. You're saying you never meet anybody who... Uh, is concerned about it, but when you talk about your fear of the knowledge-led curriculum, um, that's what I mean when I say things have changed to, uh, compared to, to what would have happened in the past, because I don't think the new curriculum or the EBAC or the emphasis on academic subjects and uh, uh, a prescription over what children should learn is just about recall, actually. I think that um, actually being able to assimilate facts and concepts and theories and remember them to be able to recall them in an exam uh, is... Uh, a demonstration that you understand it, that you've internalized it. Um, I, I, I'll give you an example from a different, um, uh, a, a different context. I sit on the council of the Royal College of Music, which is one of the best music conservatoires in the world. And uh, the teachers were having an interesting discussion about whether it was fair at the end of the four years of study to ask a musician uh, to do a, uh, an exam in playing their instrument. Because what if they had a bad day? Or what if... Um, they just didn't, you know, they, they, they were, they're not feeling up to it. One exam after four years of study, can you really, um, uh, can you really expect somebody um, to be properly assessed and examined that way? Isn't that just recall technical skill? And what the head of the department said was, in reality, there is only a certain level below which um, students, um, uh, uh, which students will not drop below, because they have achieved a certain level of competence and understanding. So even though it will vary, you can uh, judge a person's performance and understanding um, uh, in, that, in that one day. And in fact, that's a test for life. They, in the future, will go off and do auditions for orchestras, compete with hundreds and hundreds of different candidates. And they can't afford to then say, oh, well, I had a bad day. They have to be able to rise to the pressure of that. Right. So I think the importance of being able to understand subjects and recall them in a asset, controlled assessment is a really important part of learning. Um, yeah, I, I'm sure it is. And if it's a matter of life and death, it's really much more serious. So the fact that Michael Gove took his driving test seven times <laughs> before he passed it um, is... Would you apply the same set of principles to passing that as passing any other test? Research. Yeah, I, would, I think that you know, it, people should be allowed to research um, after the age of 16, and I'm glad that that will be possible in the new mm. EBAC system. The trouble is with the discussion about knowledge is that it seems to me uh, that the accurate quote, I think, is a little learning is a dangerous thing, though people quite frequently say a little knowledge is a dangerous thing, and a little learning is a dangerous thing. Um, but knowledge is, is, is exponentially growing all the time. So it's an arbitrary trillionth that we decide that youngsters should, decide, should use as the context in which to learn how to learn and how to apply things. Now, I absolutely accept that that's the right context, but my worry is that there's too much central prescription of what that might be. I'd rather leave it to the profession as I would leave it to this University uh, of London to decide exactly what the curriculum should be. Would you have any central prescription at all? I would have a little bit of central prescription, yes, uh, but I would put a limit on it, namely that for any subject it should be no more than two sides of A4 mm. so that, and that it should be broad aims so that schools could be observe that they've got a national curriculum, a local curriculum, and I hope they'd have an international curriculum. And teachers should be afforded the same method of assessment that happens in this university. If it's good enough for universities, it's good enough for schools. We respect our universities. They are internally set, internally marked, and externally moderated and validated. And that's what ought to happen, and it would be a powerful uh, development of the teaching profession. You needed, you'd need chartered assessors, 
You need local universities to be involved, but we keep bemoaning the fact that universities aren't close to schools. And quite honestly, we need a reform of the exam system because exams at 16 are frankly no longer relevant. I, to be honest, the, the, my issue, the, big, the fundamental flaw for me with the knowledge agenda is who decides what's important. And that's the biggest flaw for me. At the moment, we've had such a shift. Are we going to shift every five years? Well, I'm, I'm tired. I'm 44. I've only been teaching 21 years. I'm tired of keep having to move, change to where the goalposts are. And that's my fear. The moment it becomes about this is more important than that, rather than the application of those things, means that somebody centrally is going to decide what I have to do every day. And that's, that's just not right, because you have to reflect the children you serve. That's, the, that's for me, is, is the fundamental flaw, is we have an education system that changes every five years and is political. Let's get rid of it, let's have an education board that lasts 15 years, and let's make it about young people and what they need, rather than about one person's desire to replicate their own school experience. But that might take a, a seriously slimmed down curriculum, which government say they're going to do, and then consensus around make keeping that. Seriously slimmed down curriculum, but then a league table that sorts by certain criteria makes it a nonsense. Many are ready for I don't want to replicate my own school experience for anybody. <laughs> um, I, I mean, I, the, actually, there are certain things which, you know, throughout history, we've, we've wanted to teach to most generations. So I would say Shakespeare. Um, is something that we would want to teach children in 20 years' time and feel fairly confident that that will be there. Um, in order to teach Shakespeare, um, you could set it in a modern-day context and make it relevant. I think you can do that very well using um, urban music settings and so on. But I think it's also important that young people know something about Bible stories and the classics in order to access Shakespeare. So there are certain building blocks where, you're right, over the next few years they might change, you might add bits and pieces. But in general, the core... Um, is surprisingly constant, actually. And it was when I, when I went to Oxford, actually, I went to a comprehensive school. I went to Oxford, and I realized that all these other students um, that I was in class with had a, had a very different educational experience, and they were much better equipped, actually. They could write essays, they knew references that I didn't understand. And I think we are... Um, you have to recognize that in this country there is a segregated education system. Some kids do have access to that subject knowledge and really great teaching, and some kids um, perhaps don't and have been encouraged to take, before the age of 16, poorer qualifications, which are called vocational qualifications. I don't think they're very vocational, um, because they've been seen as not being able to, um, to do that academic core, and I don't think that serves them. I don't think it, um, it serves industry or universities particularly well either. Was there anything your contemporaries lacked in comparison to you? Um. <laughs> well, obviously not. <laughs> no, I mean, okay. you know. I felt exactly the, way, the same way as you did when I went there too, and I came from a grammar school. Because I realised... I didn't go I, there. I, I, I realised... <laughs> I realised that if you went to a public school, you had roughly three times as many more resources as you had in a state system. So I expected people to come out of that system, frankly, better equipped, because they were going to have an intensive set of experiences, experiences and, and unless the teachers were awful and the resources wasted. But I don't think that's a fair system. Well, I certainly have some, so I'll launch in on this one, which is kids are in school for 15 to 20 percent of their waking time. Their waking time outside the school is the balance. And that's a huge balance. And the research in America shows that kids who come from challenged backgrounds, the gap in their learning increases between July and September. And then the schools hold the gap until the following summer when it grows again. So what we do beyond the school is absolutely crucial. It's, incidentally, back to the public schools, they don't have that same balance that in the ones we're talking about as the leading public schools, they have kids for much, much longer uh, than is the case in the state system. So I think working with parents is crucial. I think there's a whole set of subtle arguments about how you achieve that, mm. especially when parents do not want to be 
uh, involved or are afraid to be involved, and usually they are the parents of kids who you're worried about the aspirational role models. I think some schools have pioneered ways of doing that at both primary and secondary level and could talk to you for an hour about really good ways that I've seen in primary and in secondary in the ways that they've achieved that. They don't achieve it with every parent. Of course they don't. As Michael Gove was remarking earlier this week, some parents are so inadequate that kids are not going to have the best chance of achieving. But I do think parental involvement is absolutely crucial for those kids who are at most risk of believing themselves to be failures, learning to fail. I'm just going to come in here quickly because RSA has done quite a lot of work around, I guess, democratising elements of the curriculum, and it is crucial and it is very complex. We've done a particular piece of work in Peterborough, and it does create conflict, just like it does in this room. I think we need to relish that, but we need to recognise it. One of the academies we work with serves uh, an estate with a significant BNP presence. What does that mean when you design a curriculum with that particular community? So it's worthwhile to try, but it is incredibly complex to do. Mira. Uh, well, we launched a, uh, an education report uh, about a month and a half ago. And one of the recommendations is to develop a, a London curriculum. And there'll be a workshop um, uh, today about different elements of the report if you want to hear more about it. But um, the idea of the London curriculum was just really um, to say that um, if, it, if you're a child growing up in London, um, uh, you should be able to access all the amazing things that this city has to offer. And uh, you shouldn't walk past St. Paul's Cathedral and be completely bewildered about what it is. Or if you're learning about Tudor history, well, on your doorstep are about 10 different historical sites where you can uh, see that um, in the physical, in, 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 right before you. So um, there are amazing assets and resources all around you in your environment. But this isn't about saying you should just learn about the things that are relevant to you, the things that you're growing up with that are familiar. It is about taking you outside yourself. And the great thing about London, I would say, is, and I say this as someone who grew up in Manchester, just outside Manchester, but London is um, a city where you can learn about pretty much any subject you want to through uh, the resources of the city. You can learn about history, the development of science, engineering, incredible engineering examples uh, in the capital. Um, and it's really just a way in um, to accessing that important knowledge. Yeah. I mean, just following up from that, there's a school I know that... Uh, that the uni unifying theme in the primary curriculum is that each half term, it's two form entry, each half term, year two, year three, year four, year five, choose a story, which is an international story, well known, and that's the theme for their learning everything. They actually say they can't do maths that way. I think that if they had a really good mathematician, they could. Um, but the school does extraordinarily well, and it uses what I call the common wealth of the community, which is what you're talking about. And London is absolutely amazingly rich in that respect. But other areas are richer than they might think as well. In oh, terms of course of the they are. I mean, you know, I was this week in Barrow and Furness, and Barrow, which you might think is down a long corridor, and, <laughs> you know, I won't describe it because I'll get rude, but, you know, it's, it's got amazing wealth in terms of the islands, the history, the abbey, the different uh, set of um, arrangements. Indeed, indeed, the head of the local school was a baroness. And I said to her, how are you baroness? She said, I'm the baroness of Peel Island. And people and in that community are awarded being a baroness or a knight according to what they do for the local community. And it's a tradition that's gone on for centuries. Mm. So I'm just saying there is amazing Commonwealth. Any final nothing points? to add, no. Okay, do we need to stop? Okay, I'm going to make a couple of final points uh, of using my position as chair. Uh, first of all, I'm, I, I wish we had talked a little bit about practical learning and how practical learning does fit into a general education. That's partly because my toast fused the whole house this morning. I didn't know what to do. But I think generally we need to think about how we can incorporate that, whether it's knowledge or skills. I don't know, I don't care, but we need it in. But also for me, I guess... Uh, being educated should feel like a journey, not a destination. And I think we need a sign of being educated is feeling like 
you're not quite educated and you always want to learn more. There's something about getting kids feeling that when they're leaving school, they're putting the L plates on rather than taking them off whatever course they choose in terms of career. I'd like to thank all the three speakers and thank all of your, your contributions as well. Thank you.